Chapter Twenty Two of the Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Luther. Chapter Twenty Two, The Dinner Party. Mrs. Lowell and Veronica were the first of the dinner guests to arrive. They were received with remarkable effusiveness by Diana as links with the life she was reluctantly leaving. "'Did you see anything of our musician friends as you came down to the float?' asked Mrs. Wilbur. "'No, not just now,' replied Mrs. Lowell. "'But earlier in the day I had occasion to go to the post-office, and there I found Mr. Kelly in a state of great excitement. It seems that Mr. Barrison has been summoned to New York to have his voice tried out for the opera. There is some trouble and disappointment about a tenor who was expected.' "'That is exciting,' remarked Mr. Wilbur, looking approvingly at the lady with the fresh robin voice and the charming costume. "'Miss Veronica and I are all eyes, Mr. Wilbur,' she continued. "'I'm sure you allow newcomers to stare as much as they please.' "'Certainly. Let me show you some of our snug arrangements for a life on the ocean wave.' The guests followed him and Mrs. Wilbur and her daughter regarded one another, the elder with some consternation, the younger with brilliant eyes and flaming cheeks. "'I do hope he won't have to break his date with me,' said Mrs. Wilbur. "'Perhaps to sing with the Metropolitan is more important,' returned Diana. "'You never have taken any interest in my plan,' said her mother, her eyes snapping. "'I'm sure I don't know what has come over you on this island. "'From the time you came back to the yacht yesterday, "'I have had to speak twice to make you hear anything, "'and I've been afraid every minute "'that you would let your father see "'that you were depressed at leaving this foolish place "'and going with him.' "'I am perfectly willing to go, Mama," "'was the docile reply, "'the change of heart that had taken place "'in the last fifteen minutes not being explained. "'Well, "'I'm glad to hear it,' declared Mrs. Wilbur, placated. "'You're looking wonderfully well tonight, Diana. "'Clinging stuff suits you, "'and in that silver girdle you have quite a classical appearance.' "'Do I look statuesque, Mama? "'Diana smiled, but not pensively. "'Her eyes were alive with anticipation of this one more, "'this last evening.' "'Today I have been remembering my first days at the island, "'all alone with Miss Burridge, "'the long, cold evenings with their wonderful colouring, "'the vesper songs of the hardy robins and sparrows, "'the grinding pebbles swept back and forth on the beach, "'the entrancing odours that one cannot name, "'so mingled of balsam and sea, "'the great spaces of earth and sky.' Something seemed to stop the rush of reminiscence. Mrs. Wilbur regarded her child's kindling face with fond admiration. Yes, she returned, laughing softly. I know how all that captured you, but what has it to do with your being statuesque? Oh, Diana seemed to come to herself with a little start. Miss... Burridge used to say sometimes that I look like a statue, she returned, rather lamely. Motorboats were constantly putt-putting around the yacht. I'm glad, said Mrs. Wilbur, looking down upon them now, that this is the last night we are to stay here. Didn't those inquisitive little things keep you awake all last night, Diana, just like gnats? I didn't sleep much admitted Diana. "'There they come,' said Mrs. Wilbur, suddenly, looking across at the float. Two men in white flannels were stepping aboard the waiting boat, whose brasses flashed in the light of the lowering sun. Diana's heart bounded toward her throat. "'Well, I shall make him understand that he must tell me just as soon as he knows himself,' said Mrs. Wilbur rather fretfully, watching the approach. The dinner party was a gay one. 
when the guests were seated at table, they looked out through a wide semicircle of glass at the familiar sights of the cove, its wooded shore, and the silhouettes of great waves far out against the horizon. "'I shall not forgive Kelly for giving me away,' said Philip, when his host congratulated him on his call to New York. "'How shall I feel when you all hear that I didn't pass muster?' "'Believe me,' said Barney, feelingly, "'if that proves to be the case, you'll all have cause to congratulate him. The life of an American singer in the Grand Opera Company is one fight if it isn't an inferno. The call-boy forgets to call him. The prompter forgets to prompt him. Every curtain call is begrudged him.' "'I'm glad you're husky, Barrison,' remarked Mr. Wilbur. "'Yes,' laughed Philip. Kelly has been an industrious crepe-hanger ever since the letter arrived. At the same time, he shoves me on. Oh, certainly, said Barney, setting his lips energetically. Must be done. I think he's safe to win. I am thinking about October and Pittsfield, said Mrs. Wilbur ruefully. Philip turned toward her. I think there is little doubt that I shall be with you, he answered. "'Mama doesn't mean that,' declared Diana of the steadily burning cheeks. "'She wants you to succeed, of course.' "'Yes, Barrison,' added her father. "'But when your voice fails, we know what you can do. Skip around a vessel at sea for the movies.' "'You rather liked that fracas, didn't you, Mr. Wilbur?' returned Philip. "'Indeed I did. When you come here to recuperate from the atrocities of singer allies—' I'll join you, and we will repeat the dose. Dose is the word, put in Kelly in an undertone. When finally the party adjourned to the deck, they fell into groups. Mrs. Lowell and Diana, Veronica and Barney, Mr. and Mrs. Wilbur and Philip. The sun had gone down and the western sky was still crimson. Diana put her hand over in Mrs. Lowell's lap. "'We know how violet the sea looks this minute from the end piazza,' she said. "'You will go on seeing it. "'And you will carry it away,' returned Mrs. Lowell. "'That and many another picture, which you will stop and look at sometimes on a winter day.' "'Yes, they are mine,' said Diana gravely. "'Even this pond of a cove.' with the green banks and woods rising all about it. This is a picture that I love, too. Bert was quite troubled because he thought you seemed sad at leaving. Good little sympathetic fellow, said Diana. I don't want to believe, Mrs. Lowell, that this is good-bye for us. I hope it is not. New York and Philadelphia are not far apart. But you will begin to be absorbed in other interests as soon as this yacht leaves the cove. Diana shook her head. My memory is not so short. Mrs. Lowell looked at her with thoughtful affection. I hope they won't spoil you, my dear, she said wistfully. It is very remarkable that you have come along so far, with a heart at leisure from itself. "'Oh, do you think I have that?' returned Diana, looking up with seeking eyes. "'I do, my dear. The keynote of happy usefulness is unselfishness. I have been surprised by your unselfishness, Diana, under circumstances that usually make for the other thing.' "'But, Mrs. Lowell, I am frightfully selfish.' exclaimed the girl. You don't know. Her friend smiled. Well, if you see it, that is half the battle. The other half is putting it down, destroying it. It is usually about, about people, said Diana unsteadily. I, I am afraid I am a monopolist. "'My word, but you people are interested in each other,' said Philip Barrison, 
suddenly appearing beside them. "'Just lift your eyes!' They looked up and saw the moon rising majestically above the hill road and the cove beginning to glitter. "'Now that mustn't make any difference,' said Mrs. Wilbur firmly. "'The moon won't run away, and Mr. Barrison has consented to sing for us.' "'The minutes are going so fast, so fast,' thought Diana, "'and there will be no more.' Mrs. Wilbur herded her group together and convoyed them to the music-room. "'This is really an especial treat for Mr. Wilbur,' she said to Philip. "'You know he is the only one of us who hasn't heard you.' "'And you needn't imagine,' added Mr. Wilbur, "'that you are singing for the impresario of the Metropolitan, either.' So long as I'm the chief beneficiary tonight, it's only fair to tell you, Barrison, that musically I am very despicable. The last rose of summer and Annie Laurie are where I am, so don't waste any modern stuff on me. Philip smiled as he moved to the piano, and the company chose their places. Mrs. Wilbur took a seat beside her husband, enveloped in the anticipatory glow of the matinee girl. "'I want to be where I can hold your hand if I need to, dear,' she said. Her husband glanced at Diana, flushed and grave as she placed herself on a low stool near the door, then back at the upstanding white figure beside the piano. Philip said a few words to his accompanist as Barney's fingers strayed softly over the keys. Then a familiar strain began, and the heralded voice was heard. Believe me, if all those endearing young charms that I gaze on so fondly today. At the close, the host was smiling and nodding, while his wife's eyes challenged him in mute triumph. Philip discoursed with Barney a few moments, and apparently the pigeonholes of the accompanist's mind were well stored and the contents available, for the old favorite was followed by, If I but knew at parting, to marry, and so on, Mr. Wilbur growing more enthusiastic at each number. "'You can speak, young man, so as to be understood, and you're the singer for me,' he said. "'You've been very indulgent. Now, if you don't mind, let us have drink to me only.' Philip, for the first time, turned and looked directly at Diana, her father noticed it. He was becoming every moment more alert as to the hundred percent man in the white flannels. The song followed. Diana, on her low seat, had her elbows on her knees and her chin in her hands, and never once looked at the singer. "'I have one more for you,' said Philip, when the applause had died away. "'It is a song of Maud Valerie White's, which I think fits into your category, Mr. Wilbur. It has been haunting me of late. He turned for a few words to the accomplished Barney, during which Diana looked up questioningly, apprehensively. She felt she could not bear much more of the beating upon her heartstrings. Philip turned back, and after only one running chord of prelude, began to sing— let us forget we loved each other much. Let us forget we ever have to part. Let us forget that any look or touch first let in either to the other's heart. Only we'll sit upon the daisied grass and hear the larks and see the swallows pass. Only we'll live a while as children play, without tomorrow, without yesterday. The last note was one of those high ones which Kelly had stated did such fell work upon the feminine heart, and Mrs. Wilbur's lips were tremulous as she met her husband's eyes. "'Say, my dear,' he said, while clapping his hands manfully, "'you have Barrison sing that at Pittsfield, and I'll come to your party and make love to you the rest of the night.' Philip smiled and nodded and drifted away from the piano, while Barney got up and stretched his legs. "'Where's Diana?' 
exclaimed her father, and instantly condemned himself for drawing attention to her departure. "'Oh, but she heard it, I'm sure,' said Mrs. Wilbur apologetically, still wiping her eyes. "'I'm sure no one appreciates your singing more than Diana.' "'Gone to look after her moon, probably,' said Philip. "'You know a goddess has her duties.' "'There have been things going on,' thought Charles Wilbur, with ever-deepening conviction. "'Mr. Kelly, you are a wizard,' he said, shaking Barney by the hand while Mrs. Lowell and Veronica were thanking Philip. "'You have both been so good to us,' said Mrs. Wilbur warmly. "'Why, Diana, where have you been? We missed you,' she added, as the girl came into the room. "'I—' "'Wanted to see if the steward understood,' she replied. "'I think if we go on deck now we shall have something else refreshing after this delightful feast.' Her father watched the girl approach Barney. "'Mr. Kelly, you are wonderful. I remember the comical things you said about your insignificance at recitals. I've seen again how apocryphal those statements are.' Her father continued to watch for her thanks to Philip. Apparently there were none forthcoming, and fortunately Mrs. Wilbur was too busy talking to him herself to notice it. "'But won't Mr. Kelly play something before we leave?' she said, supplicatingly. "'Oh, no, my dear lady,' returned Barney lightly. "'One has no appetite for dinner after dessert.' They went on deck and the moon was glorifying the still cove. Apparently the motorboats had sated their curiosity as to the yacht, and all was peaceful. The company sat about in a social group and ate and drank. Barney Kelly told some amusing experiences which he and Philip had had on the road last season. Diana scarcely heard his anecdotes, but she laughed with the rest. Without tomorrow without yesterday. The words sang themselves over and over in her heart, and her cheeks still burned. The minutes were flying, flying, and Philip was sitting near her mother, who waited on him assiduously and rallied him upon his lack of appetite. "'Say, boy,' said Kelly at last, "'do you know we have a cartload of music to look over, and we ought to do it tonight?' Then they would go. She would not see him alone again. "'Mrs. Lowell, are you ready?' asked Philip. "'We four will have a grand moonlight walk up to the inn.' "'No, indeed,' replied that lady. "'The faithful Bill is expecting us. I know how busy you and Mr. Kelly must be.' "'Oh, dear!' burst forth Veronica. It was almost her first utterance of the evening." "'Isn't it a shame that the pleasantest things in life are always the shortest?' She did wish Mrs. Lowell would not be so considerate of the men's time. "'Miss Diana, don't you really feel just a little bit sorry to go and leave us?' "'I do indeed,' returned Diana, receiving the girl's offered hand in her cold one. "'The best way, probably, is to remember Mr. Barrison's song and—' Live as children play, without tomorrow, without yesterday. It has been a, a wonderful playtime. But there will be a tomorrow, said Philip, approaching her. Will you come to the opera next winter and hear me peep a few lines like, Madam, the carriage waits? He smiled radiantly. That is, if I get in at all. "'Certainly. All your friends will be there,' she returned with palpitating dignity. How could he speak so gaily? Probably the dazzling possibilities of the future had effaced for him the memories that glowed in her. That is what life with him would be, a constant craving and a constant disappointment. "'I want a word with you, Barrison, before we break up.' said Mr. Wilbur. "'You have been some star in this island visit of mine.' 
he took Philip's arm and walked apart with him. "'Oh, Mr. Kelly, see the phosphorescence!' cried Veronica from where she had moved near the rail. Barney followed her. "'What do you suppose Mr. Wilbur wants with Barrison?' said Kelly softly as they leaned over the rail. "'Going to write him a cheque for a million, maybe. He'd never miss it.' "'I don't believe Mr. Barrison will need anybody else's millions. He made a lump come right up in my throat when he sang that last song about forgetting and sitting on the daisies. I just wished I was in love with somebody, so I could be miserable all night like girls in books. But—' Veronica sighed. I am the most unsentimental girl in the world. I wonder if that is what makes you so nice, said Barney, regarding her mignon face instead of the phosphorescence. You're a little brick. Do you know it? Are you coming back here again next summer? Perhaps, returned Veronica demurely. But meanwhile I live in Newark, quite near New York. I know, my dear, but when I get submerged, even little bricks can't make me come to the surface to breathe. Do you think your father would let you come over to lunch with me sometimes? You can ask him, replied Veronica. Oh, dear, is that the way you feel about it? Just the way. All ashore that's going ashore? It was Philip's voice. Come on, Kelly, and little V. Diana had been talking with Mrs. Lowell. She kissed her now hurriedly and stood rigid. The time had come. She would never go to the opera. She would never see him again. Meanwhile she joined her mother's gracious reception of the parting courtesies, and shook hands with all the guests alike. They went down the guarded stairway. It was midnight, and the cove was very still. Diana could not watch the departure of the small boat. "'I'm tired,' she said, stifling a yawn. "'Good night, dears.' She disappeared quickly. Mr. and Mrs. Wilbur stood by the rail and waved to the departing boatload. "'What a delightful evening it has been,' said the lady with a sigh. "'But wasn't it strange that Mr. Barrison wasn't hungry after singing?' I thought people always were. Didn't you think the sandwiches were as good as usual? Better. I was as hungry as a hunter. Or a sailor. <sighs> Great air, this, Laura. End of chapter 22《Chapter Twenty Three of the Keynote by Clara Louise Burnham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Luther. Chapter Twenty Three The Moon Goddess. In the twin beds of the master's room on the yacht Idlewild, two persons lay wide awake at one thirty o'clock that morning. One of them finally said softly and tentatively, "'Charlie, are you awake?' "'I am, my dear,' came the reply. "'And I should like to ask whether it is simply insomnia with you, or whether you are suffering from incipient St. Vitus.' "'Why, I thought I had been keeping so still.' It was the same way after I heard that man sing the last time. I couldn't sleep for hours. Isn't he all I said? I'll warrant he is keeping you awake, too. I think he is. There! exclaimed Mrs. Wilbur triumphantly. You do consider him extraordinary, don't you? I do. So much so that I have asked him to go out with us tomorrow night. Oh! It's tonight, isn't it? The captain says we will leave at nine-thirty and go as far as Portland. Why, I think that is fine, said Mrs. Wilbur, greatly surprised. Well, she added after a pause, you could scarcely give greater proof of your liking 
for I know how careful you are not to commit yourself to being bored by anybody on the yacht. Why didn't he tell me when he left tonight? Because he did not expect to accept. He may do so yet, however. I told him he might decide at the last minute. Why did he hesitate? Perhaps because you didn't invite Mr. Kelly. Oh, but I did. I told him they might reign supreme in the music room and work as much as they pleased. How delightful! Then why didn't he jump at such a prospect? I suppose because they wouldn't get to New York so quickly. No, nope, he has considerable latitude concerning the date for arrival in New York. I'll tell you just what he replied when I asked him. He looked me straight in the eye and he said, Thank you, Mr. Wilbur, but it wouldn't do me any good to take such a trip. It's best for me to play safe. I've passed the age when it's permissible to cry for the moon. He said it slowly, with pauses. He was perfectly willing I should know what he meant, and he saw that I did know. Will you kindly tell me? Mrs. Wilbur sat up in bed and looked across at her husband, bewildered. What the man was talking about? Can't you possibly think it out? asked Charles Wilbur quietly. She frowned into the darkness. You don't mean... He teases Diana about being goddess of the moon? She paused. You're getting warm, dear, very warm, remarked her husband. Why, Charlie, it's impossible. Then, hotly, he is very wise. Nothing would induce Diana to think of him. You wouldn't like it, eh? Why, the idea! It's an impossible idea. I was a little apprehensive at first, when I saw how attractive he was, and knew that she had been up here alone with him so long, but I soon saw there was nothing in it, and you should hear what Diana says. Yes, I know. Young girls say a great many things besides their prayers. Well, what did you say to him when he answered you like that? Mrs. Wilbur's tone was tense. I told him that he might think it over, and that I should be glad to have him come. "'Charles Wilbur!' exclaimed his wife severely. She threw off a down cover as if minded to rise. "'Cover yourself up, dear. It's rather cool.' "'But that was encouraging him, Charlie.' "'I think he perceived it dimly. He looked at me, a long gaze. By George, he's a good-looking boy, and he didn't say a word.' Then we shook hands and rejoined the others. "'You have done very wrong,' declared Mrs. Wilbur, pulling back the cover but not lying down. "'What do you want for Diana, Laura? A title?' "'You needn't use that tone. I haven't thought out what I want for Diana.' "'I have. I want happiness for her.' From the day of my arrival here I have seen signs. I am a rich man, but there's one thing I can't buy for my only child, and that is happiness. Diana is a fastidious, carefully bred girl, unspoiled as they make them, yet, of course, just as liable to fall for an infatuation as Helen Loring was. But she hasn't! She has not, Charlie! interrupted his wife impetuously. You don't know— It is you who don't know, my dear. You've been so in love with him yourself, and so obsessed with the joy of springing him on Mrs. Coolidge and your other musical friends, that you haven't seen what was going on under your nose any more than if you were a dear little bat. Don't you call me a dear little bat! Diana is much more my child than yours— a mother understands her daughter far better than the father can. The idea of you high-handedly taking this matter into your hands without even consulting me. Don't get excited, Laura. I'm not forcing anything. You've had your innings. 
You didn't even notice what that last song of Barrison's did to Diana tonight. Mere emotionality! The same thing that keeps me awake after I hear him sing. That proves nothing. It should even make you pull away from him instead of pulling for him. You're crazy, Charles. He has hypnotized you. The idea that a mere thrilling tenor voice and a fine figure could make you lay down your common sense. Mrs. Wilbur's voice quavered, and she felt under her pillow for her handkerchief. Her husband smiled in the darkness. "'Wait, dear. I don't care whether Diana marries a singer or not. I want her to marry a real man. I was on the lookout for infatuation when I saw you so captivated, and I began to inquire into the facts. I found an all-American chap who'd had a struggle from childhood and won out over poverty and discouragement by hitching his wagon to a star. He volunteered during the late war and was slightly wounded. He has a clean inheritance, good muscle, and plenty of red blood. I don't care for the blue kind myself. In short, he's the sort of man I am perfectly willing our daughter should marry, if she wants to. I tell you, yes, I know. You tell me she doesn't want to. Now I have an idea we shall very soon learn the truth about that. Barrison has shown that he knows how to get what he wants. In this case, I can see how our money will stick in his craw. Ho! Oh, from the other bed, a tremendous aspiration. Don't blow me out of the room, dearie. I know people will laugh at that idea. But I've had lots of experience in reading character. Barrison will have a great deal to overcome in his own mind. He will not feel free to approach Diana. Perhaps, after all, the affair will amount to nothing. All right, if it does. I'm a passenger now that I feel sure the boy is a clean specimen. Has it come to this? ejaculated Mrs. Wilbur slowly. That Diana Wilbur is to be given to a clean specimen. If she so desires, returned the other. Now I'm going to ask a big thing of you, Laura. It is not to speak to Diana on this subject until she speaks to you. She knows nothing of my invitation to Barrison. We can't handle the matter any further with good effect until the principals declare themselves. You know our girl. You know it is a hallmark of genuineness, a proof of pure metal when she likes a man or a woman. Can't you trust her? Mrs. Wilbur was lying down now. Her husband heard a sniff or two, stifled in a pillow. "'I wasn't anybody when you married me, Laura,' he went on gently. "'Weren't we just as happy when we economized on taking a taxi as we are in this yacht? Our boy would be nearly twenty-three now, if he had lived. I would have liked my son to look at me with his clear eyes, to have known as little of self-indulgence as Barrison. It's all up to the children. But wouldn't there be points in being mother-in-law to that voice, when you come to think it over? No answer. And soon Charles Wilbur completed his infamy by a long and regular breathing that assured his wife that he was sleeping the sleep of the unjust and the outrageous. Leonie arose a few hours later to a hard day. Mrs. Wilbur had a headache and did not leave her bed. Diana, with dark shadows under her eyes, came in to make a dutiful visit of condolence, and was well snubbed. She retreated to the deck, where her father was cheerfully watching the life of the cove. "'Good morning, dear,' he said, turning and putting his arm around her. "'We have your mother laid out, haven't we?' "'Why, Daddy, what is the matter? The coordination of her nervous system seems entirely thrown out.' He smiled heartlessly. "'She didn't sleep much, honey. Neither did you. 
regarding her closely. "'No, Daddy,' she replied, rather breathlessly. "'I seem to be more reposeful when the yacht is in motion.' "'Rocked in the cradle of the deep, eh? Want to go ashore this morning?' "'No, I think not. Mrs. Lowell is coming out for tea this afternoon. A little good-bye visit.' "'All right, then. What do you say to some cribbage?' "'Fine, if we cannot be of any assistance to Mama. Are you sure?' "'Yes, my love. She has been drinking heavily of the wine of astonishment, and must sleep it off. If there's any humble pie on board, you might have Leonie take her some for luncheon.' "'What are you talking about, Daddy? Poor Mama!' "'Yes, she is absolutely one of the finest.' I thought so when she was eighteen and cute, with a little turned-up nose and dimples, something like that Veronica girl. And I think so now. But the best of women must sometimes lie by until they get a new perspective. Daddy, I don't understand you. You and Mama have differed about something, I fear. Well, it, it might be described that way. Morris! turning toward his valet, who was near. The cribbage board, please. Diana strove valiantly not to have a miserable day. She played cribbage with her father until luncheon was served on deck. Then she gave orders for her tea, and Leonie came to remind her of her promise that she might show Bill Lindsay over the yacht. He arrived about the same time as Mrs. Lowell, and Leonie, frightened to death of her mistress's strange mood, besought Diana to remain with her mother while she should fulfill the promise to her island pal, and bid him a long and racking farewell. So Diana left Mrs. Lowell with her father while she ventured to her mother's bedside and sat down silently. A handkerchief, redolent of cologne, covered the sufferer's eyes. "'Who is that?' came faintly from the blinded one. "'It is I, Mama," said Diana meekly. "'Are you feeling a little better?' "'Diana!' The voice was still faint but stern. "'Have I been a good mother to you?' "'Mama, dear, there never was a better. How can you ask?' "'Because no one else thinks so.' Diana threw herself on her knees beside the bed and took the hand that was outside the rosy silk coverlet. "'Dearest, I am not feeling very well today, and you will destroy my poise if you say such things. My heart feels sore for some reason, so do not give it any blows. You know how Daddy and I think there is nobody in the world like you. Daddy was talking about it this morning— and telling me how cute and pretty you were when he first knew you. Diana's voice began to quaver. Told me about your dimples and everything, and how you were just as attractive to him now as you had been then, and— Diana succumbed, and tears fell on the hand she held. And if I am ever married, Mama, I do so hope that in twenty-five years afterward he— he will feel that way about me. One eye emerged from the cologne bandage and viewed the girl's lovely bowed head. Now don't cry, Diana, firmly. Why in the world should you cry? You have a wonderful life opening before you. You've known nothing yet but school, and I want you to spend a little time thinking of the possibilities of the future— with your looks and the money at your command, there is no social experience among the highest placed and most cultivated people abroad and at home that you may not enjoy. You've heard the saying, of the unspoken word you are master, the spoken word is master of you. It is the same with actions. You are deliberate by nature and exquisite by breeding. Never commit yourself to anything impulsively. No mother would be a good mother who did not say as much as this to you. Diana experienced a sudden stricture of the heart, 
that dried her eyes and held her motionless over the hand she held. She knew, all at once, the cause of her parents' difference. She had never in her life been able to conceal anything from her father. She flushed deeply. Whatever he had said to her mother must have been in Philip's favor. With thoughts humble, frightened, resentful, racing through her mind, she did not know how long she had been kneeling there when Leonie came in with soft step, and she looked up to see her mother's eye again eclipsed. She remembered Mrs. Lowell. "'Leonie is here now, and I must go, dearest. Mrs. Lowell has come out for some tea. Shall Leonie bring you some?' "'No, I want nothing. I am feeling better, Diana. Don't distress yourself about me.' The girl kissed the forehead above the bandage, and, passing Leonie, saw that her eyes, too, were red. "'I wonder if this day will ever be over,' she thought dismally. She found her father and Mrs. Lowell having a visit, charming to each of them, and tea was served at once. While they were eating and drinking, the island steamer came into the cove and up to its landing. "'I suppose our delightful musician friends are leaving on that boat,' said Mrs. Lowell. "'Shan't we stand at the rail?' and wave a good-bye. "'No, I wouldn't,' returned Diana hastily. E "'Everybody except the right ones will take the greeting to themselves, and—' Indeed, she would not wave to Philip after his cruelty in singing that song, and obeying it so literally as not to manage one word of farewell to her alone. "'Little snob, eh, Mrs. Lowell?' said her father. The steamer was turning around to leave. "'He is going,' cried Diana's heart. The whole day to have passed with no sign from him. Cruel, cruel. "'You know, Daddy, Mrs. Lowell and I must see something of each other the coming winter, if only for Bert's sake. He is related to us.' The passenger boat was passing near now. The yacht felt its waves. Diana turned her eyes toward it in spite of herself. Some people were waving handkerchiefs toward the handsome yacht, and the captain whistled three times. The yacht replied, and Charles Wilbur stood up and saluted. Diana's heart beat hard and painfully. She looked back at the tea-table. "'Tell us, Daddy, just what relation Mr. Herbert Loring was to you?' "'Why, it was this way. My grandmother and his mother were—' Diana never knew what they were, for the island steamer was moving toward the mouth of the cove. Handkerchiefs were waving from the stern. It receded. It rounded the rocks at the farthest point and disappeared. "'That is very interesting indeed,' said Mrs. Lowell. "'I shall tell Bert. He will be glad and proud of the connection.' I have a fine boy there, Mr. Wilbur. I am hoping my husband won't mind my taking such a responsibility. She rose to go. You have a good ally in Luther Wren, remarked Mr. Wilbur, arranging her wrap. Yes, and in you, I hope. Certainly, at your service. A big responsibility awaits that youngster. Let us hope he will grow up to be as clean-cut and simply honest as young Barrison. "'You do like him, don't you?' said Mrs. Lowell, with her direct look. "'Very much, so far. I don't know how he may carry sail in the prosperity before him. But so far he seems to be all to the good.' The small boat was summoned for the guest. Bill Lindsay had gone off in the dory that brought him. Diana went alone with her friend to the head of the awninged stairway. Mrs. Lowell saw the marks of distress in the young face, and she held the girl's hand for a minute. "'God bless you,' she said, and kissed her lovingly. "'Trust him, my dear,' she added meaningly. 
He is taking care of you. Claim it and know it. Goodbye. Diana watched the boat glide toward the shore. This awful day is nearly over, she thought. I feel as if my good angel were going away in that boat. Mrs. Wilbur did not arise for dinner. Diana and her father ate it alone in state. Keen to do her duty and grateful to him for his attitude toward the man whom she must henceforth forget, she had dressed herself in her prettiest gown. At twenty, pensive eyes with shadows about them are not unbecoming, and her father looked across at her admiringly. "'The Count to no account, or some other title, should be here to-night, my dear. The moon goddess is too lovely to beam upon no one more thrilling than her humdrum old daddy.' "'As if any one could come up to him,' rejoined Diana affectionately. "'You remind me of the way Mama was talking this afternoon, of all the possibilities money opens to a girl, abroad and at home.' She did not stop to think what a standard she had set up by marrying you. Her father nodded slowly, regarding her with a curious smile. Indeed. So, little Mama was able to sit up with a comforter around her and show you the kingdoms of the earth and the glory of them, was she? Well, well, foxy little Mama. Diana blushed violently and busied herself with her salad. "'I am sorry we have to sleep in Portland Harbor tonight. It won't be quiet for Mama. There were no more personalities during the meal. The girl and her father went on deck and watched the sunset together, after which Mr. Wilbur said he would go down and see his wife, and Diana was left alone. She had a deeply cushioned seat moved near the yacht's rail in the stern, and leaned back to watch the cove darken and the lights flash out on the other boats. Her thoughts ran over a resume of the summer. How long the weeks stretched out in retrospect! How they had fled in passing! Presently the moon arose over the hill road. She thought of last evening— when their group had welcomed it. Philip had said that night on the rocks that he should not forget that she was as distant from him as that planet, and he had kept his word. Not to see his merry eyes again, not to see the sensitiveness of his smile when he looked at her, not to hear him call her a goddess, not to hear him sing, except as others heard him. Only we'll sit upon the daisied grass, And hear the larks and see the swallows pass. Only we'll live a while as children play, Without tomorrow, without yesterday. She had heard the song all day, And her heart now felt sick and empty as she sat there, That golden moon beaming down upon her alone, and striking to silver the ripples across the cove. She leaned among her cushions and turned her face aside. Her eyes began to smart, and she closed them. The wind, as usual, had gone down with the sun, and the awning fringes were but faintly stirred. Suddenly she felt that the boat was moving. So smooth and silent its motion that, when she looked up, the yacht was halfway out of the cove. She leaned forward. Oh, goodbye, she murmured, and she held out her hands toward the wooded bank. Goodbye, oh, goodbye, Isola Bella. I shall always love you, and every blade of grass, and every daisy, and every swallow. Tears veiled the shadowy woods. She dashed them away, and resisted the sob that rose in her throat. The yacht moved swiftly out into the waves of the summer sea. It was now only the end of the wooded bluff which she could perceive in the moonlight. She leaned back again and, covering her eyes, 
relaxed, holding her quivering lip between her teeth. A neighboring movement made her look up, expecting her father. Philip Barrison stood there. She caught her breath. It is impossible, she gasped. Yes, it is. He took her outstretched hands and sank down beside her. It is a midsummer night's dream. But I couldn't. I tried, Diana, but I couldn't resist. Your father asked me, said I might come, even at the last minute. At each pause Philip kissed the hands he was holding. Are you? That is the one vital question. Are you glad I came, my goddess? The look she gave him in the moonlight made him take her quickly in his arms, and she sank into them with the certainty of the bird that finds its nest. I don't know how I dared this, Diana. Dared the future, I mean. How can I be the right one to win the prize of the whole world? Because you are the only man in the whole world for me, and you felt it, and I felt it. Oh, Philip, I won't be so selfish as in the way I have talked to you. I am never going to grudge that others should admire you. No, you never will, he answered. The sparkle of what others may say is like the phosphorescence down there in the unlighted places. The radiance and glow filling my whole being now is an eternal thing. I can't believe it yet. It will take me a long time to believe it, but, oh, my beautiful one, I wish, I do wish you were a poor girl. She lifted her head from his breast, looking at him with glorified eyes. I should be, she said slowly, if you did not love me, Philomel. They kissed, and the moon shone down on the beaten foam of the snowy wake in a long, ineffable silence. End of chapter 23 And end of the keynote by Clara Louise Burnham